All right, today we'll be reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Now the cry of the Israelites had reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought, people out of e when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Thank you, Chris. It's great to see everyone today. Being able to worship God is always a great thing, and just being able to be in His presence. We've been talking about God's peace recently and trying to find some ways in which that peace is something that's part of our life and something that we're able to get as well. This is connected with that, but a little bit different. We want to talk about what God being with us means. And so just think with me for a few minutes about what that means to say God's with us. Um, is God with you today? Do you feel like he's here sitting next to you, watching, reading the notes you're writing, <laughs> hearing what you say? <laughs> sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes not such a good thing. When a child goes into a dark room it's either turn on the light or come with me, right? I want some to come with me. Because if you're with me, I'm not afraid because I know you'll take care of whoever it is. And so that's one of the things that we do. What does it mean to be with somebody? Children always want a parent with them. We don't think we can do things alone. If you look around when you go to a restaurant, there are a few people who go out to eat by themselves. Why is it? Well, they usually want someone to come with them. And if someone asks you to come with them to dinner, what, what does that mean? What are they expecting? Is that just dinner? Do you have to talk to them? Do you have to have any conversation at all? Or is it just, okay, well, I'll bring a fork and uh, we can all just eat. Or if you invite them to go camping, what does that mean? If you invite them to go fishing, does that mean you're going to have fish for dinner? If you stop at the store on the way back, if someone goes to court, who do you want with you? Maybe someone who's there who knows what's going on. What about in the hospital? Do you want somebody with you? What about when you're sick at home? Sometimes it's good to have somebody with you, right, that can go get you all the things that you want. And so we want to look a little bit today about what this means to have somebody with us, because I think that's a big part of our world. We think about this. There is a time when God decided, I'm going to be with my people. Uh, that time was in the Exodus. The people had been taken down into Egypt. They become captives down in Egypt. They were rescued. Moses was born, and uh, he was born as a captive down in Egypt. He was rescued by a princess. He grew up in the palace. He was educated. He knew all of the things about their government and about the way in which it worked. And now he's watching sheep in the wilderness. And by Exodus 3, we find God appears to him in a burning bush. It was a burning bush. I know sometimes we get the little, I think God in a burning bush is a, it's gotta be an awesome sight to see God in a burning bush. He was off watching sheep in the wilderness, having given up his career in the government and having run away and God speaks to him out of that bush. And he says, I've seen all the affliction of the people and I want to deliver them. And so I'm going to send you back to Egypt. And I want you to go and, and deliver my people from Egypt. Well, by this time, they had gone down as one huge family, about 70 people. And now they're 100,000 up to 2 million people. Just think about how many's coming to your house for Christmas and multiply by, yeah, 10 million. 
that's a lot of people. How are you going to move that many people? How are you going to get them to go? And so Moses' first reaction is, well, who am I? Who do you think I am that I could do that? And God's response is, I will be with you. Would that be comforting to you? I mean, if he just said, I'll be with you. Okay, well, why didn't I think of that before? If you'll be with me, then everything is perfect. Everything is fine, right? And every issue that we face and every difficulty we come, if God says, I'll be with you, does that resolve it all? Does that make it all go away as if, well, it, boy, that's great. I don't have any worry or any issue then if you're going to be with me. And so when we think about that, what does that really mean to say God is with you? That's the perfect answer. But is that a comfort? Moses had to take the same promises to Israel. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. We want to go out in the desert. We're going to camp. We want to worship God for a little bit. Finally, they end up leaving Egypt through plagues. If you're familiar with the story and God humbles one of the mightiest nations on the earth at the time and he destroys them. That's what he meant. I will be with you. So we will be able to leave. We will be able to go out of this place. And when they get out to Mount Sinai, they make camp. And he had given them instructions at Mount Sinai of exactly how to build a place to worship him. And he puts the place to worship them in exactly the center of the camp. If you think about that, what he was trying to do and trying to say is, I said I will be with you. And so everybody is right around here. All of the tribes were gathered right around the tabernacle. And inside of that tabernacle is the open view of the tabernacle where only the priests were able to go. And so if you were in kindergarten or first grade, you got this lesson upstairs this morning. And so just ask one of them what tabernacle is all about. And so priests would go in, they had the showbread, they had the candlestick, they had the altar of incense, they had the Holy of Holies. And you know what was in the Holy of Holies? It was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant sat two cherubim. And between the cherubim was called the mercy seat of God because God was sitting right there. They knew exactly where his chair was. Talk about God with you. Can you get any more visually specific that the God, the creator of heaven and earth is right with you? And to top that all off, there is a cloud that sits over it in the daytime that is a constant cloud that's there. And it, it, it isn't that when it gets dark, you can't see it because it turns into a pillar of fire at night. And you're able to see exactly God sits right here. Would that be a comfort to you? That I am sitting with God right smack in the middle of my camp. Would you worry about anything? Yeah, the answer is you'd worry about everything. What are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? How are we going to travel? How are we going to do all this? And they failed to realize what God with them meant. All of the power of creation was right there. They were children of Abraham. They had an inheritance they should know and realize. They had a promise. They had covenants from both Abraham and Moses now since the law had been given. They're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. That's a good thing. That doesn't mean you have to clean it up. That's, that's one of the great things that says it's going to be a fruitful land. But you do have to walk to Canaan. You do have to cross two major bodies of water. And there are no boats. Just so you know. Is that a good thing? God says, don't worry, I'll be with you. And there are going to be enemies on the way. 
And there's going to be very limited things to eat. In fact, you get manna and you get quail and there will be some water. And you're going to have to fight battles because there are these enemies that come. And when you get to the promised land, don't worry, I give you the promised land. But you do have to fight the battle in order to claim your part of it. And they must obey God. And they must treat him as holy. And they must not sin. All of that's what it means to have God with them. It's very much like Adam in the presence of God in that Garden of Eden. But when he sinned, he's put away from the presence of God. He's not with him anymore. He's outside, and so Israel would be as well. So they're on a journey with the people of God. What do you think? Does God with us mean anything for us today? I think what we come to a lot of times is, well, well, who is he? I don't know who he is. I mean, God with him, is he going to pay my bills? Is he going to get me Christmas presents? Is God going to take care of me? And what is it exactly that he's going to do for me? And we come up with some things like that that says, well, you know, if he's not going to do those, I'm not sure I really think God's with me. But God is an eternal goodness, a purity and love, and he is a person who is there, who is always with us. And we can see and hear and feel that God is in our presence and that we are in his and that he has a plan and that things are going to be done his way. And he has told us what the plan is. That's always a good thing. He tells us exactly what it is. And ultimately, he wants us to be mature and for us to be grown up, for us not to be just little children, but for us to be able to be with him. In order to do that, we need to be free from sin. And so we need to get past our sin, repent of our past mistakes, and we are able to become holy like God. And so what does that mean? Well, that means there's limitations. So we have limitations, maybe the same way Israel had limitations. Well, no, I thought God with me meant he's going to take care of me. He's going to do everything for me. God will bless, but it's not the easy way. It's fairly simple, but it isn't easy. People don't think God is with them because they want an easy God. I want God to make everything fine and wonderful. I want God to straighten out all the relationships that I have. And so we begin to develop this false concept of God and of who I really want as God. Why doesn't God make life easy? After all, we pray to him to fix things, right? We pray to him about health. We pray to him about sickness. We pray to him to heal things. We pray when we have problems. Sometimes the problems we caused ourselves, but we pray to him about problems and God fixes those. And if we don't have a God who fixes those, who gives me money, who pays me rent, who gives me Christmas, I'm not sure I believe in God anymore, right? No, I think we've missed the point. We don't know who God is because that isn't God. And what we would do from that point is develop False gods, ones that are not really God, but maybe it's the God we wish. And so it's little g gods, right? And that's what they did back then. They said, well, you know, what I need is more crops to sell so I can get more money. And so my crops need sunshine. So I'll pray to the sunshine God and to the rain God so that now I'll have more money to be able to get what I want. And so... They did all of these things in order to make false gods, and we exchange the true God for something that'll make me rich and something that'll provide. We want a God of luck. We want a God of fortune, and we don't always see it. Israel came up with this one. Israel came up with a golden calf. And they could dance and they could party like there was no tomorrow. Because literally, there was no tomorrow. Moses came back and took down their God and ground it up and made them drink it. 
That's how big your God is. Well, but we wanted a party, and that God let us party. And your God doesn't let us party. So we want the party God. There's no getting away from the reality of the wilderness. Because that's where they were. That's where God had led them. That's where he was taking them. And he took them out into the desert and said, I'm bringing you to a better place, to a new land. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. But we're in the wilderness. I know that's where you are now. But I want you to realize that you're going somewhere. And I will be with you. Not only through the wilderness, but also when you get there. And oftentimes we're just looking for a way out of our own wilderness. For some God who would deliver us from the journey and we don't really care which one it is. What matters most, however, is who you're with in the wilderness. It's better to be lucky. How many times have you heard that? Better to be lucky than good. That's the motto in golf. Because <laughs> I'm not good. <laughs> okay. So the only hope I've got is luck. <laughs> but is that really what we want to live by? Is that really the God we want to serve? That it's better to be lucky than God? There's luck comes in two forms. Good and bad. So there are good luck things and Sometimes it's bad luck things, and we all understand how this works between good and bad. It's 50-50, right? And so half the luck is good, half the luck is bad, and we have the odds of being able to get 50-50. Well, that is until you actually start counting it. And my luck never turns out 50-50. Neither does anyone else's, because there is no such thing as even, as perfect not even flipping coins, you are not going to hit 50-50. It's one of those odd things, but we always believe that. We think it'll be true. Life balances, doesn't it? Not even mathematically. It does not. There is a randomness about it that is just one of those things we cannot explain. And so we start counting and hoping for our 50 to come around. Some things they do not tell you about luck. No one lucky ever lives forever. Luck always runs out. Luck is never permanent, even if it's good for a while. And luck is sometimes against other people. There are winners and losers, right? And so my 50 is when I'm the winner. And, well, I didn't want you to not have yours. But that's what it means to be lucky, is that somebody's going to lose to me. And that's what we want as our God. For now, we win. There's the God of one more chance. I'll get it right next time. I know I messed it up this time, but I'll get it right next time. Next time, it'll be better. I need a chance to start over. And I would be good if I could just, just, just get back to the beginning and just start over again. I would do it all right because I have so much experience now. I know that it would work. And we're never able to do it right again because there were reasons why it didn't turn out that way. One chance to start over turns into one more chance to start over and one more and one more and more, one more and then there's the main one I think we use. And that's the God of the fairy tale. We may have started out poor, but soon it's going to change, right? Life will get better. That's what we tell ourselves. Next year will be better. This is only 2019. We've got a 2020 coming up. Next year's going to be better because that's the fairy tale. It always turns out that way. Every single fairy tale turns that way. And we soon we get our big break and we get our happy life. And when the big break comes, it's always while you're still young, by the way. Watch any cartoon or Disney you want. It always happens while you're still young. 
And so we're able to get the big break and we will live happily ever after, right? What if your life right now is your perfect life? This is as good as it gets. Is that going to be awful? Would you be happy? We want to be a prince on a white horse. We want to find a damsel in distress, one that would let us rescue her. You know, they're not so willing anymore. We at least want the white horse. But then white horses are a lot to take care of, and, you know, you have to feed and water and brush and take care. Well, damsels are a lot to take care of, too, actually. So when it gets into the fairy tale, they require upkeep also. And so who knew that? The end of the fairy tale is always the same. You ride off into the sunset, right? Everything is wonderful in the sunset. And it's all paid for. Everything in the sunset is free. We all know this. It'll all be better in the sweet by and by. The sunset. And we believe in God of the magical place. Rather than God who is with us. Marriage is not a fairy tale. It is not magic. A happy home is not being lucky or that you married the right person because you were lucky enough. It may be because you have worked very, very hard at it. Happy life is not when you are given one more chance. It's when you realize and make the most of the chance that you have. And no amount of luck or chance or power will fix the world and make it your way. And neither will God. After all, he created and he wants it to be his way. And there is the major difference between us. We want to make our own God because I want the world to go my way. Invent your one. Because I'm not sure how else it's going to happen. But I want you to listen to what the description is about our God and about how it worked when Jesus came. Because it is very different than all of those. And in John chapter 1, he's just giving you the introduction to here's what he was looking for as Jesus came. The Apostle John writes, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, and he was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The true light of enlightenment came to the world in a world that he owned, in a world that he made, in a world that belonged to him. And the world said, we don't like you. We won't accept you. We don't want you. Because you're not making the world about us. And so his own people didn't receive him. After thousands of years of prophecy, they didn't receive him. They didn't even know that it was him that they were looking for, even though they were still looking. They just kind of looked over the top of him. Well, well, yeah, not you. We're looking for somebody who makes our life perfect. Some did believe. And they realized there was something different there. It wasn't even on the same plane or even in the same ballpark as what they had been thinking of before when they were trying to think riches will make me happy. But he gave them the right to become children of God. Born of God, born of water and spirit. Born of God as they were disciples following. Born of God as they recognized his majesty and his glory. And they swore allegiance to him. And they sat next to holy God in physical form. And he looked just like him. They were born into a family. With all the privileges of family that apply. 
and all the relationship that goes with being part of family, but it was a relationship that was deeper than blood. It started with the blood of Jesus and it ends in holy and spirit. And it was much different than anything had been before. And then John writes this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said he comes after me, ranks before me because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. What an incredible thing he's trying to tell us. If we can just grasp what he's trying to get, because it isn't about our life and God making our life perfect. It's about God coming here and allowing us to see his life and what his life looks like and saying, you could be part of my life. And so it's an invitation for us to be part of his life. The word became flesh. The thought and reason of God put on skin. And he lived among us, right with us. And John says, we saw his glory. Like the son of the father, full of grace and truth. Well, did he have a halo? I mean, that's what you see in all the pictures, right? That means he kind of had this little glow on the back of his head, like a cow lick that you can't quite get to stay down. Is that what it means? Have you ever had a friend that you just loved? I mean, they are just a fantastic person. They just are. And you don't know why, but there's just something about them. And you like to be around them all the time. You like to be there with them. You like to talk to them. You like to do things with them. If you're really lucky, that person you get to marry, that's even better. But there's people that we just, there's something special about them. And I think that's who Jesus was. And it's not that they straighten out everything in your life, but somehow you feel better just because you're around them. And none of the problems went away, and there were no powers and no miracles and no magic things, but you felt more like you. It's called grace. And they were always honest with you. And sometimes you wish they weren't so honest with you, but they were always honest with you and they would tell you exactly what they thought and not what you wanted to hear, but they would give you exactly what the right answer was. So sometimes they straightened you out and sometimes you realize they're just being truthful. And so grace and truth came through Jesus. His forgiveness is no fairy tale. It was real. His forgiveness is not just lucky that someone forgot your sin. It is permanent and it is forever. And we don't need one more chance to get it right. He says, no, you failed enough. Let me just forgive it and let's go on from here. It's not even a do-over. You don't even have to repeat it. We're just gonna go to the next stage and I'm gonna accept whatever you had and call it good. No one has ever seen God, but he was with us. See, there's no question that Jesus was loved by God. And you see his life being blessed so much as he comes and lives in very difficult circumstance, in a very difficult childhood, in a very difficult ministry. And all of those things are difficult. And yet you have no question that God is with him and empowering him and there present in his life. And he is following the plan of God and he operates and works and thinks and talks on God's initiative. And all of those things are what God would do and God would have him do. 
And so the difficulty of ministry and the difficulties of childhood allow us to join his family. That's his invitation that we might be adopted as children of God. And the stress of Jesus' life, well, it's got to be stressful, right? I mean, you're Savior of the world. Don't you think that'd be a, a little bit stressful with all the people and all the mistakes that we make and all the things that go wrong? And he does it with grace and truth. He didn't straighten out all the mistakes. He did not fix. He forgives. And he gives grace. And we go on. And it is so much better than being lucky. So much better than a do-over. So much better than any kind of fairy tale that we could have. We watched as he gave grace and as he spoke truth to everyone. Sometimes they were blind. Sometimes they were beggars. Sometimes they were Pharisees. You see, if we go back to luck and chance and fairy tales, it's just about our tiny life. But that wasn't him. We have a chance at something bigger than the sunset. Because he's the guy who made the sunset. How amazing is that? And he's the one who invites us into his eternity. We don't need those little G gods. So let me just ask, where's God today? Well, he's here. That's why you came, right? To be able to meet him here. And I don't need more luck. And life is hard enough, but you know what? He just says, ah, we'll just go on from here. Because it's called forgiveness. And it's called grace. And he'll be honest with me about what I need to fix. Do you want a life with him? Do you, do you already have this life with him? It starts when we give up our own will and our own fairy tale and our own chance and say, I want to be part of your life, God. I don't want you to fix mine anymore. I'm going to give up mine for yours. And we repent of our sins and we're baptized into Christ to become one part with him and we join together in worship to him. I'm not sure that all happens without this worship that you're sitting in this morning.